Let's open our Bibles today to Romans chapter 15. This has been a kind of a crossover from chapter 14 into chapter 15. And we have now been in chapter 15, crossing from chapter 14 for three weeks. This will be the fourth lesson in chapter 15. And admittedly, I have come in on Sunday mornings, and I'm always over-prepared, and therefore I know that I will never finish what I have intended to talk about, uh, and so I'm already prepared not to finish today, uh, and I probably should warn you that I'm going to talk about this one subject for probably two to three weeks. Um, originally, I had planned to talk a little bit about this on Christmas Eve for our Christmas Eve services. We'll be having three Christmas Eve services this year. I believe they're at 1 o'clock, uh, 2.30, and 4 o'clock. And so we'll want you to sign up for those. We'll make that available to you soon enough. We do need to have you sign up because we'll end up filling all three, but we want to make certain that we don't have to turn anybody away. And so we'll want you to probably get a ticket or sign up somehow so that you can come. It's free of charge, of course, but it just helps us to be able to manage uh, the room. Otherwise, a thousand people will show up for the one o'clock or the 2.30, and then what do we do? So well, we'll want you to be involved with that. But I will be Providing a devotional, we have communion, we light candles together. It's really a fun night. If you've not been here for our Christmas Eve services, you have a treat coming uh, your way, and so I'm excited about that. But I had intended to talk about Israel uh, on Christmas Eve. I'm not certain what I'll do yet, but we have entered into a passage that I think needs discussion in Romans chapter 15 and it relates so much to Israelology now for those of you that have been around candlelight for any length of time uh, you already know that we are supporters of Israel we are not supporters of everything Israel is doing today we are not necessarily in support of Israel's politics we are not at all in support of their rejection of Jesus as Messiah. But we are aware of the fact that God has chosen Israel and that we are participants with the Lord, in the Lord, and with Israel in his overarching program in the entire creation of the world as it relates to Israel. One of the things that has been a trouble to me in the church is, first of all, the omission of Israelology, the study of Israel, in systematic theology. If you have a systematic theology book at home, if you have one in a library, if you've taken time to look at this subject, you will find that almost zero attention is spent on Israel in systematic theology. That is a mind blower to me because the Bible is a book about Israel. It is a book about the Israeli Messiah. And we're gonna talk about that today. We're gonna talk about it next week and the following, I suspect. Uh, I'm going to take the time to read a lot of scripture, take you through some passages that I think are related here in this text that are just highlighted for us by Paul. But for the Jewish mind, if they were reading this letter that Paul wrote to the Romans, they would immediately fill in the blanks. It's uh, kind of similar to something that might happen to you or to me. Uh, if I just started to sing the children's song, Jesus Loves Me, This I Know, you would be able to continue uh, with the lyric. Or the psalm, the 23rd psalm, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want, and you would be able to finish that. And so we find that often in Scripture, that in the New Testament, especially in this Jewish flavoring, that the 
recipients for the most part would be able to fill in the blanks but for western civilization for the greek mind for christians in the church age most people don't understand that the bible is a jewish book about a jewish messiah and they don't have the history that we need to understand about it and so we're going to take some time on this i think it's important admittedly uh, last night when Brenda and i were kind of decompressing and watching a Hallmark Christmas movie. It, it, it's, uh, I've avoided it until after Thanksgiving. <laughs> but f- foreknowing that it was going to happen to us, I decided to restart recording them. And so I, I went through on the Hallmark channel and I looked at the titles and I looked at the storyline and I thought, okay, that one looks like it might be okay. And we'll record that so that I wouldn't have to l- watch the ones that I would certainly not uh, desire. But I'm 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 a girly man anyway. I I cry. I cried yesterday. It was Christmas in Rome, and uh, it was awesome. Of course, we've been to Rome a couple of times, and being able to see the sights there, it was really a, a cute story. But I digress. <laughs> but when I was watching the movie and kind of thinking, it, I started to realize that for me. And I hope you don't mind if I just take my time and work on this with you the next few weeks. So I'm not in a hurry. Um, I started realizing that I love Jesus and that my love for Jesus is because I know him. I remember many years ago as a new believer, people asking me, don't you just love the Lord? And I was a brand new believer and I kind of thought, well, I guess. I mean, really, I mean, because I didn't know him. And and so it's hard to love someone you don't know. And um, it was only when I started to really study the time that Jesus spent on the cross that I really got to know him in his great sacrifice for us. And I remember just weeping. I, I think it was then that I felt called into the ministry when I was studying the words from the cross, the seven words that Jesus spoke from the cross. And I remember, and I'm gonna make every effort not to cry today, uh, that um, when I got to those words, I thirst, it penetrated me deeply because I realized that Jesus was fully God, but he was also fully man. And with all the sufferings that he had gone through, he felt what would be in comparison an insignificant bodily need for water. I thirst. And it made me aware of the fact that he was suffering so greatly, but that I would be then, in that moment, the one that would want to run and get him a drink. And I remember telling Brenda about this, and I told her, I says, I never want to give him anything but fresh water. Now, you know the story. They gave him vinegar and gall mixed. He rejected that. They later gave him vinegar. He did sip from the the vinegar, the sour wine. Um, But uh, I've always wanted my life to reflect what it would look like to give the Lord a drink and always to provide him with fresh water. I've gone through seasons in my life where I felt like my water became a bit cloudy or muddy and I needed to be refreshed in the Lord. But the point I'm making here is that I fell in love with Jesus because I got to know him. And as I was thinking about that last night, I started thinking about the fact of how much I love Israel. And almost to the point where I I felt like my affection for Israel was so great that second to my love for God himself in the, the, the triune nature of the Godhead, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and embodied in Jesus himself, my second love, if, it, if you could even say it that way, uh, not to suggest my wife is not my first love in this world, but um, it would be Israel. And it dawned on me that most Christians don't have a clue about a love for Israel. Many people come to candlelight for the first time or visit candlelight and they talk about the fact that we have an Israeli flag and a menorah in our church. They don't understand it. 
Uh, today is the first, or tonight, actually, our, t- our calendar would be the first um, evening of Hanukkah, Festival of Lights, a miracle that God provided Israel after the, the blasphemous activities uh, that had earlier taken place in their history where Antiochus Epiphanes sacrificed a pig on the altar, uh, creating an abomination of desolation, a type of what was still in our future in their future, and uh, they don't understand why we would have an Israeli flag in our church. They don't understand the significance of a menorah. I I purchased that one myself uh, in Israel and had it shipped here uh, to the church. We used it on Christmas Eve. You'll see that with all the candles and everything. And um, it's because most Christians don't understand that we are serving a Jewish Messiah and that we are studying every day of our lives a Jewish book. And so I wanted to talk to you about this in great detail, not just as a a passing conversation that I could have had with you, but I want us to begin to understand the Israeli nature of our religion. We are effectively embracing the Jewish faith today. Now, that's confusing to people because they think about the Jewish faith today being uh, those that are under the Old Covenant, Uh, that think they're still under the Old Covenant, that still wish that they could sacrifice on Mount Moriah or the Temple Mount, as you're uh, familiar. Uh, They see the Jews as the Christ-rejecting population, and they are, and we'll talk a lot about that in the next couple of weeks. But if you were a Jew and you had come to know Jesus as your Messiah, the faith that you embrace is the true Jewish faith in its fullest context, in its present form. And if you were a Jew or a Gentile today and you embrace Jesus as the Messiah, the religious standards by which you live, the doctrines and teachings that you embrace are identical. There is zero difference between the Gentile Christian faith and the Jewish faith in its fullest form today. Now, there are changes that will take place, and we're going to talk about that. We'll be looking at the Old Covenant and the dispensations. We'll be looking at future dispensations. We'll be looking at the church age. But we are actually a group of people, and I don't mean just members of Candlelight. I mean all Christians around the world are a people that are embracing the Jewish faith in its proper form in this hour, in the church age. That's a mind blower for many people. They don't understand that because they don't understand what the Bible is. And that's probably because they don't really understand the Bible. And I want people to understand the Bible. And so my love, of course, I I digress again and tell you that I love my wife uh, and I'm thankful for my wife. But my loves that God has placed in my heart, first and foremost for the Lord himself, Secondly, for Israel, and again, I'm separating this from my, my, my bride, my beautiful bride, I love my wife, but then the church. Uh, so this has always been a challenge. How do you love God's people and not tell them the truth? How do you love Israel and not represent the true biblical perspectives, and how do you love Jesus without understanding Israel? And how do you understand Israel unless you understand your Bible? And how do you understand your Bible and love people if you don't tell them the truth about the whole counsel of God? So there's a little bit of an introduction. How's that? Thank you for coming. (laughs) Let's take the time to read the text today and then we'll just get started. I have no idea where I'm going to wrap this up uh, today, but... Be prepared to to be attentive the next few weeks. Don't miss the next few weeks of Sundays because it will help you so much. Romans chapter 15, starting in verse 8. Now I say that Jesus Christ has become a servant to the circumcision for the truth of God to confirm the promises made to the fathers and that the Gentiles might glorify God for his mercy as it is written 
For this reason I will confess to you among the Gentiles and sing to your name. And again he says, Rejoice, O Gentiles, with his people. And again, Praise the Lord, all you Gentiles. Laud him, all you peoples. And again Isaiah says, There shall be a root of Jesse, and he shall rise to reign over the Gentiles, and in him the Gentiles shall have hope. Now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. And Father, we do come before you today as we open our Bibles together and we ask that you would lead us, that you would teach us, that you would guide us, that you would give us understanding, that you would broaden our perspective, that we may be able to give an answer to everyone that asks of us for the hope that lies within us with meekness and with godly fear. We thank you, Lord, for the Bible. We thank you for the truth that is contained within the pages of Scripture. We thank you for sending your only begotten Son into the world, not to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved, and that indeed is the whole world. But we thank you that he is the Messiah of Israel. He is the promised son of David. He is the one that has been foreseen and foreshadowed from the very beginnings of the book of Genesis all the way through in his great glory in the new heavens and the new earth in the last chapters of the book of Revelation. Thank you, Lord, that we have the scriptures that we can study and we do pray that you would multiply this truth and impact us with it as we take the time to study and think these things through today and the weeks following for we give you thanks and praise in Jesus name amen well verse 8 says that Jesus Christ has become a servant to the circumcision now remember Paul is writing to the Romans Uh, This is a group of Jew and Gentiles together. He has not been to Rome yet, and he will be there desiring to be with them, and so he's writing to them, explaining to them about the nature of man, the nature of salvation. Uh, He inserts some dispensational teaching about God's work with Israel in their past, their present, and their future in Romans 9, 10, and 11. And then we got involved in what we call the section on orthopraxy or the way we should live, practical applicational truths. And so now in this kind of closing, he has several closes as you'll note in the next months, uh, probably less than months, maybe a couple of months. (laughs) Somebody's laughing already. You've been here before. That... Paul is going to just kind of begin a benediction and in the benediction starts with the Romans understanding of the fact that in that group of Jew and Gentile blended together in, as believers in Jesus uh, whom he is addressing through this book by telling them that Jesus has become a servant to the circumcision. Now That's really interesting to me. And as a servant to the circumcision for the truth of God to confirm the promises made to the fathers and that the Gentiles might glorify God for his mercy. And then he gives three citations and then adds a fourth with a benediction about hope. The citations that are listed here I'm going to take us through over the next weeks in detail. And so there's no chance of getting even started on it today because we'll be looking at uh, 2 Samuel chapter 22 and Psalm 18. We'll be looking at Deuteronomy chapter 28 all the way through chapter 32 in detail. Psalm 117, which will take a minute. It's just a few verses. And Isaiah is chapter 11 and 12 along with other passages that will come into view. If I feel led, before we are finished, I'm going to spend some time talking to you about the promised land and the geography that the Bible describes in relationship to 
the promised land so that you can see what Israel has yet to come and that they have not yet inherited and that they will inherit because it relates to the promises made to the fathers as Paul mentions it here. Jesus Christ has become a servant to the circumcision, that is to the Jews, for the truth of God to confirm the promises made to the fathers. And so promises have been made to the fathers from the very beginning. And so today, I guess I wanted to begin to do a walkthrough with you in a quick overview of the entire Bible. Is that okay? <laughs> uh, Shane's going to put a dispensational graphic up there because the, the dispensational teaching that we embrace here at Candlelight is related to the way we interpret scripture and it, it relates to the way God has been dealing with men in different periods of time throughout history but this timeline actually shows us the entire Bible it begins in the garden in, with creation and God creates man in his own image we talked about the image bearers mankind last week when Seth was here if you don't have a dispensational model, we do have them available to you. They're bookmarks. You can put one in your Bible because it literally teaches you the entire Bible in a bookmark. But from the very beginning of creation, when God created man, after the sixth day, he looked at everything that he had made and he said, it is very good. Everything that he had made. So Lucifer had not fallen. Uh, the angels had not fallen. There were... Uh, there were uh, in the garden Adam and Eve they had not fallen and all uh, the fact that we had an earth without death uh, is critical to our understanding so sin entered the world in chapter 3 when man was tempted by Lucifer Eve proper and then her husband also with her and Satan usurped the authority of God over his greatest creation, man. And he wanted to exalt himself to become like God. And God had commanded the men, man and woman, Adam and Eve, to obey him. And the only way that Satan would really be able to get a position in, their, in, the, in all of creation that was greater than God would be to have God's creation obey him. And so he tempted Eve and she ate of the fruit, and her eyes were open. She gave to her husband also, and that was when sin entered the world, and thus death and the curse. And so the first worldwide judgment, the divine worldwide judgment was the curse. That happened after the fall of man, and sin entered the world. At the time of that moment afterwards, when God was communicating with Adam and with Eve, he gave them what is a prophecy referred to in uh, biblical scenarios as proto-evangelum. The meaning is that we had an advanced knowledge of the gospel. And in this context, he told them that the seed of the woman and the seed of the serpent would have conflict. And there would be enmity. Uh, enmity is, an, is, is a perfect hatred. And, and a, a breakdown. And so the seed of the woman would bruise his head, the seed of the serpent, and the seed of the serpent would bruise the, the seed of the woman's heel. That was Jesus. And so we have a prophecy about Jesus. Moving forward in the processes, we have this time of uh, God's dealing with men and, and the development of, uh, in, in relationship to mankind and uh, God's commands for them. And in due time, there, the idea is that there was going to be um, a tremendous uh, growth in the earth and God uh, intended that man should be righteous and live properly. And in that context, told them, obey me, and they did not. And man became wicked. And the wickedness of man was so great that he desired, sadly, to destroy all of mankind save eight other 
individuals. Noah, his wife, their three sons, and their three wives. So eight people. Eight, by the way, in the Bible is the number of new beginnings. And this was the flood. After the flood, you have a period of time in which we have mankind commanded to go and scatter over the face of the entire earth and to multiply and to prosper. And instead of obeying the Lord, they disobeyed the Lord and they gathered together in Iraq. Uh, it is technically in Babylon. And in Babylon, they would gather to build a tower that we know of as the Tower of Babel. The Tower of Babel was a place where mankind unified under one leader, Nimrod, and they desired to make a name for themselves. This was where man began to understand and embrace humanism in its fullest context in the earliest years. Now by this time, you are only going from chapter one of Genesis to chapter three where the fall occurred, chapter six where the flood occurred, and chapters uh, up to chapter 11 where you have this dismay of the mankind in the scattering of the Tower of Babel and God sending people all over the earth, separating the languages. I suspect that it was that time that the nationalities began to uh, emerge because God separated the people and they would form clusters where they could talk to each other. Uh, and so you naturally had division and God created this on purpose. It was from that time, and I'll abbreviate the, the rest and we'll continue uh, this as we move into this in the next week. After the Tower of Babel and God created the nations and their dwelling places, their boundaries, some of the scriptures will indicate to us, uh, scattering them dis and, and disallowing them to have communication and unity, uh, a globalism, if you will. He destroyed globalism. And he, he then chose a particular person. His name was Abram. And he called Abram to himself and he told him, I'm going to make promises to you and to your wife and I'm going to change your names. I'm going to breathe upon you. So the name Sarah uh, was Sarai. And so it's changed from Sarai to Sarah and Abram to Abraham, and so he breathed on them, as it were, and separated them and miraculously allowed them in their old age to have children, uh, a child that would be the son of promise, and moving on forward into the development of the nations, he chose Abraham to be the father of the nation and people of Israel. And so I want you to get this perspective. You are in Genesis chapter 12. That's as far as you've gotten until Israel is on the scene. And through the development of Abraham and his son Isaac and Isaac and his son Jacob and Jacob and his sons, and you have the sons now in, in growth and population, they end up in a famine and they go into Egypt and they're in the, in the processes of being in Egypt, God, God allows them to grow into a great nation in Egypt and then out of Egypt, he delivers his son. There's a, a double reference this in this context. And he delivers Israel out of Egypt through the Red Sea under the leadership of Moses. And so Israel is already on the scene, is already developing throughout the earliest book the book of Genesis, starting in chapter 12 and moving forward. And uh, for the sake of our conversation today, I'm just going to abbreviate and tell you that Israel is the primary focus of your entire Bible from Genesis chapter 12 all the way until the end of the Gospels. And so now you're looking at what would be this brown half circle in your graphic, the Old Covenant. So from the call of Abraham and the sign of the covenant, the old covenant being circumcision all the way until the cross where Jesus suffered and died as the servant to the circumcision, the promised son, the promised Messiah that would come to Israel to deliver Israel from their sins is from Genesis chapter 12 all the way to the end of all four gospels. So technically, you're 
Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John in your Bible should be Old Testament. And that's why I tell people all the time, tear that page out of your Bible that has the words New Testament on it starting before Matthew because it's placed in the wrong position. It needs to be, at the very least, in front of the book of Acts where you have the birth of the church in Acts chapter 2. Quickly, and then I'll, I'm going to wrap up because we're out of time. From Acts chapter 2 until Revelation chapter 3, the end of chapter 3 is the church age. And in the church age epistles, the, the history and the, the teachings, all the way through the exhortations to the churches, the seven churches in Asia Minor, that typify all of the church age in various forms and in all time within the church age. I'm not a, a, a person that believes that each one of the churches represents a period of history in the church age, but rather that it is a picture of the entire church age and all of these churches are manifest all at the same time during the church age. So from Genesis chapter 12 to the end of the Gospels is Israel, and from Acts chapter 2 until Revelation 3, you might suggest right at the front end of chapter 4 where John says, come up here and I'll show you things that will take place after these things. After what things? Well, the church age. And then from chapter 4 into 19, you have the tribulation period, which is the red half circle on your graphic. And then you end up with Jesus coming and rescuing Israel in chapter 19. And then from chapter 19, he establishes his earthly kingdom, the, the purple half circle. And so in chapter 20, you have a very brief insight into the millennial kingdom, which is a thousand year reign of Jesus, the Jewish Messiah from Jerusalem as the monarch, the king of the world, the king of Israel, until finally in the last chapters, you have the new heavens and the new earth. And so what, I'm, what am I telling you? I'm telling you that the majority of your entire Bible is about Israel. The entire Bible is about Jesus, and Jesus is a servant to the circumcision. To fulfill the promises, he served Israel, the circumcision, to fulfill the promises made to the fathers beginning in chapter 3 of the book of Genesis. The Bible is a Jewish book about a Jewish Messiah And that's it for today. God bless you. Be warmed and filled. <laughs> and we're going to take the time. We're going to talk about this. Because I think it's that important. You need to understand what the Bible is all about. It's about Jesus, the Jewish Messiah, who is the redeemer of his people, Israel. And we, as Gentiles, being blessed by it. Let me just make this comment in closing. Some people think that because God made a comment about Israel throughout the Bible, that God only had purposes and plans for Israel. And that is not true. They think that in the Old Covenant, the only people that were in God's purview were the people of Israel. But that is not true. All the way through the entire Old Testament, we talk about the Gentiles. All the way through, God says, I'm going to call you, Israel, by my name, for my purposes, so that I might make myself known to you, so that I may make myself known through you, that all of the world may know me. And so, I'm just entering into the Christmas season. I'm just entering into the Festival of Lights, Hanukkah. I'm just entering into a discussion about the glory of Israel, the glory of God, the apple of his eye, his people that he has redeemed by himself without our help. And I'm glad. I hope you'll join me in this journey. Amen? Let's stand together. Thank you, Lord, for this time. Thank you for this privilege of serving you, knowing you, loving you, being loved by you. As Gentiles, most of us. Thank you for the Bible. Thank you that we have this book that we can understand. It's not hard to understand. 
Give us this grasp, we pray, in Jesus' name. And send us forth today from this building to share hope as Paul concludes the passage. The God of hope give you joy and peace. Lord, this is a great season of hope. We live in a world that's in turmoil, but we have hope because we have promises that are sure. We don't look to the left or to the right. We look directly to you. We give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you guys.